Good afternoon and welcome to a brand new episode of Free Wheeling. It's a brand new week, but we continue to work from home. Yes, it has become the new normal. And you know what? I have to say that there are things we are doing right now we never thought were possible and uh, still hoping to get you all the information that you need, everything from the automobile world covered right here as well on Car and Bike. And uh, as promised, I have my guest with me today. Uh, the man needs no introduction really because uh, I know that many of you are already aware of who he is. Let me quickly bring him in here. And there he is. That's Partha Datta, the uh, man who heads the FCA business here in India. Good afternoon, Partha. Good afternoon, Siddharth. Very nice to be with you and hello to everybody online. Uh, we're going to start getting a whole lot of uh, traction, I know, because a lot of people will have a lot of questions for you. So yes, guys, if you have questions, I know that many of you are already saying hello and signing in. So. Uh, Partha, I know you can't see that, but uh, there's lots of people who have already started to sign in and, and they're wishing you as well. So, uh, Thank you. Yeah, so I will bring their questions to you, but uh, let me start by firstly saying uh, that it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, I uh, know that it hasn't been that long that you have been here in this particular position. Uh, I will talk about what you were up to before that and how this is not the first time you've been at uh, uh, FCA India. But, uh, but this particular job, I mean, it's obviously an important one. It's obviously one that is um, perhaps, you know, something that is now at a crucial juncture as well from the FCA global perspective. Talk us through it. What's, what's it been like the last few months? Oh, uh, it's been absolutely exciting coming back, repatriating into India, you know, the place where I was born and grew up. And uh, it's not like I've not been in India, you know, over the years that I've been in the U.S., I've worked in India as well as visited several times, so I'm not, you know, new to the market. But I've been uh, blessed in being fortunate enough to have worked on both the industrial and the commercial sites, even in India. My last stint here was on the industrial side. And now coming back to the commercial side, it's very exciting. But excitement also comes with uh, uh, a level of, you know, a thrill that times you have no control over which is the market dynamics. So I've come at a time when the market's actually been uh, very challenged. And I look at it as an opportunity. The only way now is up. Yeah. So, you know, uh, it's been very exciting. No, I love that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm always a diehard optimist. And so hearing anything positive always brings a smile to my face. Uh, I, I, appre I also appreciate the fact that, you know, like you said, there are many sort of contexts and layers to this. Uh, the fact that, yes, you have uh, you know, the, you know, just the, the fact that you have this Indian heritage itself would be one of those layers. Um, and, uh, you know, as I mentioned briefly earlier, uh, you've had other roles that you have played here in the India business in the past. Yes, yes. I mean, all of those contexts that have added to my experience, you know, that's the circumstance that, you know, has added the ability to be you and the perspective that, you know, I bring both from the art of the possible and the feasibility of things on the industry. So on the commercial side, being so removed from how things work, even in things as simple as the training, there are angles that a person from the industry bring, you know, and I find myself constantly in a place that I feel very privileged. Okay, uh, as I mentioned, there's lots of people who are saying hello to you. There's uh, Selesh, Harsha, Sandeep, Shom, Rishabh. I mean, lots of guys who are wishing you. So I thought it's, you know, something I must uh, uh, definitely highlight. Uh, ever since you got here, of course, you know, the, the, the big news on the product front uh, has been the introduction of some of those products that you have brought to the market. I mean, we've had uh, just recently, in fact, just before all of this happened and the lockdown happened, you brought in the uh, diesel automatic on, on the compass. Uh, the compass itself, of course, remains the sort of backbone of, of the business. And, um, you know, it's been, the, it's been the car that has in many ways defined where you're taking that business as well, isn't it? Yes, I think uh, the compass has been our mainstay. It's our localized product. Much beloved, I might add, in uh, India, you know, awarded SUV in 17 and 18, as well as, you know, the brand itself getting the most trusted automotive brand is something that we're very, very proud of. So yes, the Compass has been the backbone. And like you said, most recently, it was the diesel automatic on popular demand because our customers were looking for an automatic. 
So that's, you know, I couldn't agree with you more. It has been the main stand. We're very proud of all that we did. In fact, it was uh, our 2018 car of the year as well. So we are very happy and proud of that uh, as well. For us, it becomes a special car for that reason. Um, it wasn't, of course, I mean, you're right, there was popular demand and there was a lot. In fact, there was a clamor for months uh, as to when you would have the uh, diesel automatic. So it's great that it's now in the portfolio. I know it's been a short time and, of course, things right now are crazy. But do you have enough time to be able to gauge some reaction from the market? What did dealers tell you? Uh, the dealers, uh, frankly, from a product standpoint, both dealers and customers, they've been very, very, very happy with it. I mean, I've actually visited dealerships in Andhra Pradesh, uh, in Tamil Nadu recently, both Hyderabad, Vishakhapatnam, and in Chennai. And I've also gone to Kerala. And everywhere that I've gone, the one thing that people have given me unanimous feedback on is that it's a fantastic product. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were already excited with the Trailhawk, right? But this, on the diesel automatic, like they said this one really, really writes well. They were all super complimentary on the dynamics of the vehicle and, you know, its drivability. So positive feedback all around. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the Trailhawk as well, since you mentioned that. It is obviously the sort of flagship of your range right now in terms of what's locally built. Uh, it's a car that got a lot of attention globally, in fact, not just here. Um, and, and, you know, obviously when it comes to uh, the, the true sort of heritage of Jeep and everything that the brand stands for, it is the variant that sort of talks to that the most. So uh, that's been a good sort of brand flag bearer for you? Yes, it's been the, on the Compass lineup, it's obviously the iconic vehicle, right? If capability has to be defined in that nameplate, in that segment, the Trailhawk defines it. You know, it's, uh, the it epitomizes the go anywhere, do anything part for that particular segment. And it is our flagship, and it's been very, very well received. I see every time I go on a, a Jeep trail, um, you know, whether it's a legendary Jeep trail or others, I get people who own it are just absolutely ear to ear grins, having fun. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that is what the brand is all about in many ways. Uh, I think uh, those who know me well enough know that that's what I'd rather be doing uh, than being on a track, for example, you know, being on a trail somewhere. Uh, some of the best uh, and, and most exciting trails we've been on have been with Jeep, in fact. Uh, so, you know, uh, I, I'll be very happy to acknowledge that and talk about it anytime. Uh, tell me, though, that all of this in an Indian context is not always easy to sort of, um, you know, filter down. And especially when you've got so many different sort of layers to filter through, which is one is your direct communication. Then, of course, it's your dealers who are actually, you know, playing that role of uh, talking to the end consumer. Uh, to get that level of not just capability, I think communicating the capability of the vehicles is still relatively easier, but to get that kind of culture going, you think uh, that's something that started to happen now ever since Jeep arrived here? Yes, I think uh, our Jeep community, uh, so I'll start with, let's say, the training itself. Our sales executives and yes. the people who are actually on the floor dealing with our customers and the dealerships, they're all flag bearers and they all believe in what they represent. And several of them have actually done what these vehicles, I would say more 90% of them, have actually done what this vehicle and seen what it's capable of, that capability That's of important. that particular. Yeah, very, very important, right? Because if you believe it, you don't have to do anything other than, you know, the communication is more natural, more organic, more automatic. And in as far as your second part of the question was, uh, you know, what does it mean to the customer? Yeah. I, watch the community, the Jeep community, there's Jeep clubs all over, they're active, they're, you know, there's, they're members themselves, they're advocates on their own, because the product speaks for itself. So they're very, very happy, very thrilled to be part of this uh, big, large community of people, this family. You know, Jeep, uh, Mr. Manley sometimes says, was a social brand way before Facebook became social media. You know, that was the community brand. And, you know, there's very few brands in the yeah. world that can do that. So, so this is, you know, something that I've seen happen in India. That layer is something that I've seen formed. And thanks to a lot of the work that the team has done, we see the very valuable community advocacy. And I'm very proud. In fact, even today with the COVID thing, there are so many heroes out there, you know, that we want to recognize. 
people who are doing works on the front line there while I'm sitting and you're sitting and we're safe at home trying to obviously do the right thing. But these people, you know, have that ability and that and that persona where they want to be, you know, they want to volunteer. You know, mm -hmm. they have those large hearts. So I'm very, very proud of the community that Jeep developed in the country. No, it's true. And in fact, uh, I, I can uh, even go on talking about Mike Manley forever because, you know, I remember when he first took over um, as the Jeep CEO, uh, while Mr. Marchioni was still around too, uh, everybody, I think globally, unanimously agreed that he's just the right person for that job because he really gets the brand. And I think he's also done it a great service ever since he's then taken over from Mr. Marchioni. So, but that's, you know, never mind my opinion on that. Uh, I think what you also mentioned is very, very crucial, uh, the current situation. Uh, it's obviously not a situation that uh, any of us could have ever dreamt of. And so, you know, planning for a time like this is never in your worst case scenario sort of plans, right? It's not something that you would ever, um, you know, have a little book to go to. Um, yeah. Given that, I think, you know, when everybody gets thrown in at the deep end, um, how you come out of that and what you do is always going to be what matters. So tell, mm -hmm. us, tell us how it's been like at uh, FCA India. I mean, you're, you're obviously at a point where as a company, as a brand Jeep, you know, there's, there's lots that's all set to happen. And then you have this massive roadblock like this. So how, how are you dealing with it? Yeah, so from, uh, you know, obviously the first thing, most important thing for me is that my uh, team, my colleagues, um, they're safe mm -hmm. and their safety is paramount. So we've obviously instituted the work from home. We've been doing, you know, an amazingly good job, I think, Better, like you said, we, you know, in the preamble when we were talking off camera, as we were saying, you know, it, it's been surprisingly efficient, you know, that people, we've been able to get a lot done than we thought we were going to be able to, because like you said, there's no playbook for this. Yeah. We don't know. We didn't know what to expect. Uh, personally, as far as the business front is concerned, I conduct weekly town halls uh, to update the employees where necessary to give them the right news and, uh, you know, if we can motivate each other. I connect with various teams um, all over the country to make sure that the products and projects are ongoing, get, you know, updates on those. Mm -hmm. Usually we use Google Hangouts, sometimes it's email, phone calls from my partners. Um, we also are keeping our customers digitally engaged. We have a brand campaign. And like I said, we really want to honor those heroes, those out there, those warriors who are voluntarily, you know, doing whatever, you know, the rest of us are unable to do simply because you know their skill set and the activities that they're involved in. Um, on the business side, uh, I have communications to make sure that all the constraints, whether it's product related or whether it's making sure that we're doing everything we can for our dealer partners, all of those things, um, you know, I have regular meetings with both my Asia Pacific headquarters in Shanghai and Auburn Hills. So that's we're developing the playbook as we go. We have a worldwide, you know, set of best practices that we always share and practice. Because some of them are at more advanced stages, like China is coming out of this, yeah. uh, while the rest of the world maybe, you know, somewhere midway through it. So we're trying to learn from whatever we did in the east, further east, and that's how we're making our playbook up as we go, keeping in touch with our community. And, and the scenario when things open up, uh, how are you sort of gearing the uh, network for that in terms of the dealers, the workshops, all of that? Yeah, so from a workshop standpoint, clearly we're going, the retail experience is going to change that. I believe that there are some things that are going to be so different now that we've got customers who are going to want, you know, private space. Yeah. They don't want probably to be intimidated in being in large crowds. They want the dealership to be... Um, you know, up to standards of sanitization and hygiene that maybe in the past it wasn't important for them. So all of those things were already, we have plans in place to make sure both the workshop and the dealership floor space is clean and hygiene and sanitation is to the levels that we expect customers to want. In addition to that, we're taking the retail experience more online. And, you know, customers are going to be able to do a lot of, you know, except for the wheel kick and the walk around, they're going to be able to do everything from home and have the vehicle brought to them rather than, than you know, them having to come. Activities that pretty much, I wouldn't say just us, most OEMs 
would be, you know, gearing up for. So that part of the retail experience, I think, has changed. Forever. That is then the new normal, I guess, that uh, or one of the things that we would start to call the new normal. Uh, two, you know, huge topics which become inevitable in any conversation when you talk about FCA. And I know you're going to say I'm being yeah. cliched here, but, you know, I have to get into that. The first one I will yes. get into right away. The second one I can see that there are tons of questions that are already coming on that. So I don't even have to preempt that one. As soon as I get to those questions, you'll, you'll hear it. So the first one is, of course, what happens in the post-merger scenario. Uh, I know that there have been many questions about it. Uh, FCA, PSA, huge giants. Uh, we still, I know, are waiting for a lot of that to, to sort of go through. And in the Indian context, I know that's even a longer wait. But is there any part of, uh, you know, your strategizing that starts to prepare for that ev eventuality? So, uh, unfortunately, so that I am not in a position to talk about the merger, um, especially FCA, PSA. I don't know much about it. And whatever little I do, it isn't appropriate for me to talk about simply because we're in the embargo phase uh, and the merger is, you know, in the process. Yes. So I wouldn't want to comment on it. You know, I probably it'll be a, a couple of months later that maybe when things are a little more solidified and information, you know, uh, is more easily available. I know what you know, what I read in the newspaper. So I'll leave the merger question there. I can't comment on it any further. No, that's fair. And I had a feeling that is what you would say. But like I said, you know, elephant in the room, have to get it out of the way. No, no, uh, no. <laughs> and, uh, you know, let's not forget that uh, many people are very excited by all the various possibilities. So we'll wait. We'll wait and see what happens. Um, the second is, of course, the topic that uh, we'll get to. So, as promised now, I'll get into those questions because, you know, I don't want to eat into too much of your time. Uh, there are many people who have asked this. So, uh, guys, if, those of you who feel I'm not asking your question, don't worry, it's been acknowledged. Uh, there's Rishabh who has asked about this. There's uh, Shailesh who has asked about this. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the question is about the sub four meter space. Uh, is that uh, something that, you know, is that something you're looking at? Sure, I'm sure every brand does. but. Uh, how quickly can we expect some action on that from FCA? So the sub four meter SUV is being very actively studied. I can't give you a time frame, uh, so, so that I, I can't. I can tell you that that was the commitment that Mr. Marchioni made yes. in the uh, Capital Markets Day in 2018. So it has been something that we're very actively studying. And beyond that, I won't. It'll come to the market. But, but I can't tell you a date or I cannot give you a timeline for it. But certainly is something that will excite you as, uh, you know, someone heading the India business because I'm sure that your dealers would be very excited by it as well. Yes, trust me, I get calls every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Include, including today, right? There's, I always get calls for it and it's natural and it's, it's the place where the bulk of the, you know, market is and we are very, very actively studying it. The commitment is that there will be a sub four meter SUV coming, but I can't tell you any more than the fact that we're actively studying it and that it will be sometime in the future. Okay. Uh, you know, my follow up to that is that uh, never mind, obviously the potential of that segment is, is obvious. Uh, the fact that you are doing something there is also now known because like you mentioned, Mr. Markioni had, had spoken about it, but I want to flip it around a little bit. The experience that you've now had with uh, the local manufacturing of the Compass, uh, you know, the fact that you've uh, had, had the platform now indigenized here, you, you know, you have high levels of local content, you're doing all the right-hand drive cars here as well for the world. Uh, what, are the, what are the learnings from that? Because obviously when you have a car like the Compass, which is, you know, relatively still a little bit more premium than something which is going to be sub four meter, um, you, you still, uh, and, and yet you achieve those levels of localization. Uh, the learnings from that will only be, uh, you know, maybe multiplied or, or used manifold in the smaller car project. Yeah, for sure. The, the, the learnings from that will be used. You know, one of the big things, obviously, as you know, in the sub four meter or any um, B low segment and further down from a price standpoint is going to be uh, the platform in itself. Yes. So that's the part that we're trying to address. And all the learnings that we have from the compass clearly will go into that from, you know, from scalability, from reuse of components, from, you know, standardization, from the localization of certain designs and, you know, the supply base that we use in India, which frankly now we're beginning to use for the rest of the world as well. So all of those are learnings that we're going to bring and bear 
on the sub four meter SUV, and there wouldn't be any product more apt for it because we need all those learnings on. So also then to, to sort of expand on that, when you had the development of the Compass happening a few years ago, for sure there were inputs from the Indian market and you know even your Indian India team that definitely would have gone towards what came out finally as the production model. Uh, but when you yeah. talk about sub four meter uh, SUV, it becomes perhaps even more relevant. I mean, again, I know it's going to be a global product, but um, would you say that there's been a greater input from Team India and a greater, therefore, part of that development? Yes, I think whenever we talk about entry level segments such as sub four meter, you know, the primary markets where the input comes from are Brazil and India. Yeah, and you know, every every other market begins to become the add-on, the step up, the next, you know, modular piece. Clearly, the biggest piece that goes into this are from two imports. One is from Brazil, one is from India. And uh, other cars in the global portfolio, cars like the uh, Cherokee or, uh, of course, the Renegade, a lot of questions on that always. And there are questions today as well. Um, what's, your, what's your thought on that? Not just for India, but, you know, markets, basically not just Western Europe or the U.S., other markets. Do you see a lot of pull from that? A uh, lot of pull from the Cherokee, did you say is that? Cherokee and Renegade both. So right now, if I were to look at the Indian market, still the biggest segment is the B and the sub four meter and maybe the C, right? There is a D segment, you know, that we're going to be considering. And I can tell you today on your show that a three row SUV will be coming to the Indian market with, you know, to the Jeep showrooms. So that was also something that we connect, we had committed to, and the Cherokee is a D segment product. You're not going to so, say when. <laughs> <laughs> the when part of it is the only question you know, Siddharth, yeah. that I can't. Yeah. No, I know. I, I, I completely respect that too. Um, the, the Cherokee, of course, I know uh, globally has has been, in many ways, the car that uh, people were surprised by, and then now also has become a great definition of where the brand is going to, just like the Compass is in India, I think. So uh, so that will be exciting. Um, and in, you've had the experience of the Grand Cherokee, of course, here in India. Um, and then you just recently also brought in the new generation of the Wrangler. So um, let, let's talk a little bit about that. What's the, what's the reception been like on the new Wrangler? Well, I think the Wrangler is such an iconic product. I mean, the, the first shipment sold out, I mean, we did, you know, get the yard and it sold out quite fast. So it's, the Wrangler has always got this iconic following. It doesn't matter uh, whether it's this year, next year, doesn't matter. It's been one of the more sought after nameplates and the most recognizable, most awarded, and, you know, something that epitomizes the brand. Go anywhere, do anything, you know, everybody wants to be the Wrangler, right? It's, it's that, image the hero vehicle in the brand. So we've had a great response in India so far, and uh, we're hoping to make that even better. A quick question that maybe the, the customers also ask you often when you meet them or you speak with them, uh, about uh, making the Wrangler more accessible. Now, of course, our duty structure doesn't support anything like that, but do you foresee a scenario where you can look at maybe at least a local assembly sometime in the future? Is that something that you consider ever? Just from a pricing yeah. perspective. Yeah, I, I think I think it's something we would consider. I mean, you know, um, and it's something India is a very important market. FCA is committed to this market. So, yes, it would be absolutely something that we would consider. In fact, we I would say that thing that we should consider. Okay, that's good. That's very heartening news, I must say. Um, and, uh, you know, okay, so we, we'll take in a couple of other questions. Saurav uh, is asking... Uh, a question which I think I suspect I know the answer to. Will Chrysler as a brand launch in India? In the future, there are no plans to launch Chrysler. I think about as direct an answer as I could give you on the... Okay. It's not, you know, never say never, but in the near... Not launch, right? All right, and is that is that also the kind of strategy we are seeing globally uh, from FCA to you know have specific brands sort of leading the charge in certain markets? I think from the big lines, right? And then you know, depending on the market market demand, the particular brand 
branch, I think they would see where where those would fit. That would be the, the generic strategy, I would say. Okay. So Jeep continues to be the global brand, so does Alpha. Alpha, right? And then, you know, there's market demand demand and strength of brands in other places, and that's how Dodge is great in the U.S., right? You know, uh, Chrysler and Dodge very strong in the U.S., and, you know, Fiat's so strong in Italy and in the rest of Europe, and, you know, we have uh, the strength of Jeep all over, whether it's China or India or the U.S. or Europe as a brand, that's one of the icons. Well, of course, then comes the inevitable question about Fiat. I mean, uh, had a long innings here in India, and there are still, uh, you know, a huge legion of fans. Uh, I'm one of them. Uh, how do you foresee that playing out? Is that something that you've shut the door on, or is that something that could still very much be reopened? So, uh, so that I'm a fan of Fiat too, by the way. I mean, I grew up. I grew up in Kolkata and Vishakhapatnam, and you know, I'm used to seeing Fiats all around me ever since I was little. So, I'm a big fan of the brand, and it has a, a storied history with India. Right. I know it's. Few cars that you saw when you grew up. Today, the demand in the marketplace, the body style that's in demand is SUVs. I mean, everybody who's anybody wants an SUV, right? That's whether it's the B segment, the C segment, the D segment, it doesn't matter. Everybody wants an SUV. And here we are with the preeminent SUV brand in the world. So for the immediate future, we're focusing on SUV. Fiat continues to be an important part of the FCA portfolio, and it is not exiting the market. When the time is right and there is demand and there's opportunity, we will consider products of Fiat to be brought back. For now, the focus is Jeep. All right. But that, that excites me because, uh, you know, there, there could be a sort of a good synergy going forward once I think the market matures a little bit, especially in the compact space where perhaps a lot of variety is what the demand might be. I mean, we might see a situation where what is conventionally the best selling right now, which are small hatchbacks, but become small SUVs of different shapes and sizes. So, uh, yeah, it's possible. It's possible. So that, and I can tell you for sure that the brand is not exiting the market. And for all the viewers out there, all the Fiat owners out there, your after sales is taken care of. You have parts for the next decade. You don't have to. I mean, we're here as FCA for the brand that you bought. That's great. No, that's, that's reassuring as well. Uh, another area which uh, I want to get to before, again, we get back to some questions is uh, at the CES this year, uh, I had the chance to see some of the uh, plug-in versions of the Jeep vehicles as well. Um, when it comes to electrification, I get it. It's not probably the first thing that even the customer is expecting from Jeep necessarily as a brand. But uh, given global targets and, you know, where the whole automobile industry is going, uh, what are the kind of uh, areas you see Jeep getting into? And then, again, from a local perspective here in India, what part of that do you want to participate in? Yeah, so uh, I'll take the two-pronged question from the first one first. So that uh, the EVs are the future. We recognize that, okay? Every manufacturer realizes, you know, that's where the regulations are headed. We all have to get there. Yeah. So as you know, Jeep, uh, from although there may be a few people who don't expect that, Jeep and Mr. Manley and Christian Munier, the president of the brand, they both publicly said that Jeep will be the greenest SUV brand in the world. So we've developed program products. You've probably seen in CES the plug-in Wrangler, right? I mean, I've personally been involved in, it, in its engineering. It's a fabulous product. We have already on the shelf a minivan that's plug-in. We just introduced the Fiat 500 BEV in Europe. So whether it's battery electric, electric, or plug-in hybrids, the technology exists in FCA. As far as the market's concerned here in India, I think we're watching and, you know, uh, watching the infrastructure as it grows. Yeah. And as it becomes, you know, gets to the point where we need to introduce these electric models, today, I think in the next few years, the percentage of EVs is still going to be very small in the market. Because I think even though customers are going to want EVs, it is still going to be a very small percentage. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that is the demand that's out there. So we have the technology, we're ready to deploy it. And okay. we're monitoring the market. But, uh, but when it comes to especially the, the sort of high end of that market, you know, the guys who are coming to you for cars like the Grand Cherokee, for example, um, 
the, the, the more well healed. Uh, sometimes there is an expectation from their side as well when it comes to stuff like this. So do, are you picking anything up at this point or is it just too premature? Even no, I think the Grand Cherokee, you know, and all of all the entire Jeep line is going to be electrified. The entire Jeep line, whether it's, you know, from the entry segments all the way up are going to be electrified and we'll be ready with it. Mm -hmm. However, bringing it, you know, into a particular market will depend on what that demand for that market is, including mm -hmm. India. Right. So right now, I cannot tell you that there are very, uh, you know, uh, large demand and, you know, high percentage that I see in any segment that's going to be electrified. And I also feel that customers still have this range anxiety that they're going to feel when, you know, unless they get in with a battery, uh, in, any electrified vehicle, unless they get in with a plug-in hybrid. And as you know, in the market today, plug-in hybrids have a tax disincentive. Yeah. So that's going to be something that's going to play into the range anxiety piece. And we're studying to see how that demand evolves. Okay, that's fair. Um, I think, um, you know, there is certainly going to be some expectation on that, perhaps going forward, if not right now, uh, on, you know, just that whole area and also what it will developed into perhaps i think that's the that's the better way to put it we'll be ready we're ready so that we have a grand cherokee that will be electrified and we'll have that to bring in for those customers that need it okay um so quickly pulling up some of those visuals of uh, the uh, compass and uh, wrangler that were shown at ces I, I thought it was uh, you know interesting to see that because it was also a nice surprise i have to say at the show nobody ah. expected that <laughs> Because all you expect is electronic goods. Well, you know, it's turned into more of a car show of late. I think that that's been said enough, uh, and which is which is what takes people like me there as well. Um, <laughs> all right. To be fair, I before you know we run out of time, I must ask you some of the questions. So let me get back to it. Ajay has a question for you that's related to the portfolio. Uh, I feel there's a huge gap between the Compass and then the next models available in India. Is there any plan of launching something in between? Yeah, so I can tell you, uh, is that Pankaj, did you say? Ajay. Ajay. So Ajay, I can tell you that there's going to be a three-row SUV that's coming to the market in the near future. We're, I, I reiterate, we're very actively studying the sub-four-meter SUV. So that is something we've already announced in the Capital Markets Day. I can tell you that there are two other iconic products coming to a showroom near you soon. And all of this in addition to a new compass. All right. So that's going to keep you really busy and the team for sure. Uh, a lot of people did ask about the Fiat brand, but luckily you've already spoken about that. Um, and Sagar has an interesting question for you. What, according to you, is the best selling point of the Jeep Compass? The best selling point of Jeep Compass is its, is its capability, its reliability and durability. So, you know, it's it really is. I mean, guys, um, I would say that Having been on the site that actually built the car, I can tell you that it is an extremely durable product. It's an extremely reliable product. And in fact, you should all be very proud that in the entire world where five plants produce compass, the best quality compass is made in India. And it is made in Ranjangam. In fact, I'm not just saying that. I'm saying that based on the quality numbers that come out of it absolutely spectacular build quality very very good from a durability standpoint and when i say capability i mean the tractive capability those, those i would say are the most important i can tell you that i mean i've been there i've uh, seen the production and uh, the plant is very impressive i think it's uh, it's always nice you get goosebumps when you walk around uh, it's always nice seeing uh, production anyway but uh, but yes the compass assembly is is quite uh, quite impressive yes um, Will we see more uh, variants of the Wrangler Rubicon in the near future in India? This is Mohit's question. Will we see more variants of the Wrangler? The Wrangler Rubicon, well, the Rubicon is a variant. But. Yeah, more variants of the Wrangler. Yeah, whenever uh, there is a bus model, yes, there will be more variants of it for sure. There'll be other bus models of the Wrangler coming in. Stay tuned. Okay, that's great. Uh, a lot of more questions about some of the other brands which we have addressed including a question, by the way, on the plug-in hybrid. So I'm glad we spoke about that. Uh, Tarun asked about whether we'll ever see Dodge in India. But again, I think you have addressed that. 
But there's a related part to his question, which is interesting. The 2,500 units rule, which is, of course, the non or, or, or homologation fee uh, cars that you can import and, and sell. Uh, is that something that FCA is actively looking at in any context outside of the Wrangler? Yes, we're looking at, you know, we're looking at that in the context of being able to bring in vehicles, obviously, for local assembly. Uh, you know, the obvious question that comes in, we are. We definitely look at it. Um, one thing that I must say is that's only one side of the equation, right? Like if you were to take a plug-in hybrid, there's the other side, which is the commercial side. Yes, the industrial cost, you know, and the homologation is one. Piece. So both of those have to balance each other. So we are studying. Absolutely, we're studying. Okay. Uh, Harsha has a question about connected cars. Uh, will we see connected car tech from G? Yes, we will. Very, very soon. All right, that's nice and direct. Uh, let me see. There's uh, a question from uh, my colleague, Amir. Uh, currently, you have 80 sales and service touch points across 70 cities, of which 12 are smaller touch points called the Jeep Connect expansion, uh, called Jeep Connect. Uh, what are your expansion plans when it comes to network? Well, right now, we're, uh, we're, we're present, and I think we have a market coverage, you know, close to 80%. And from an expansion standpoint, we're always looking for the right partners. And, you know, if the market has potential and, you know, my network development team is, you know, this is a constant everyday strategic, um, you know, uh, loop. So it's, it's constant, it's ongoing. We're looking for the right partners in the right cities. Um, and if the throughput's there for both of us to be profitable, for sure, you know. I can't go into the details of whether it's going to be 80 or 800 in the near future. But, you know, I can tell you that uh, we're happy with the network and, you know, we will continue to look for the right partners right. to make sure that we're both profitable. Um, now, this is a question that, uh, again, I think I already know the answer to because, uh, you know, the segment itself is not something that we ever even talk about in India. But it, it's a question that I'm, I'm still curious to hear what you have to say about, not so much for the answer, but for the vehicle itself. Uh, what about Jeep's pickup truck for the Indian market? I'm assuming the new Gladiator. This is sort yeah. of a question. Uh, I don't know that there is a pickup truck that can be brought here that is not under the commercial uh, vehicle license. So from a market standpoint, I don't know how any imported product in any volume can ever be successful as a passenger vehicle here because it will be priced just, just because, because of the duties and the yeah it will get into a price you know so stratospherical it won't be a reasonable vehicle as a commercial vehicle leave alone a passenger vehicle so right now i have no plans to um you know bring the gladiator in here as a uh, you know but who knows very maybe cool. things change in the future yeah. Yeah, it is very cool. I mean, I have to say, it looks really yeah, I fantastic. <laughs> I want one. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, uh, you know, I've had the chance to just see it, obviously not drive it yet, but uh, it, it is. It does look very cool. Uh, a lot of people still continuing to ask questions about, uh, and, and comments about Fiat. A lot of Fiat fans. Shankar, for example, says, uh, good evening, Partha. I'm a big fan of Fiat, especially Abar. Uh, would you have any future plans on Abar? Uh, good evening uh, to Shankar as well. Uh, I, right now, we're going to focus on Jeep. And, you know, if in the future we see that opportunity, Abad remains to be a brand in the Indian context. It is not exiting the market. You can still see the signage up on our dealerships. So that's, you know, right now we're focusing on Jeep. All right. Uh, there's a question. Uh, I, I've lost track of where it is, so I'm forgetting who asked it, but uh, about clarifying between the Cherokee and the Grand Cherokee. So when you talk about uh, the, the vehicle that is being considered for India, is it the next generation Cherokee or the next generation Grand Cherokee that you're referring to? Well, all I can tell you is that it's a three-row SUV, and therefore I would put it closer in dimensions and size to the Cherokee. All right, fair enough. But that doesn't, again, then um, change things for the Grand Cherokee customer. You might still look at bringing in more Grand Cherokees in the future. For sure. We could we could look into bringing in more Grand Cherokees in the future if the demand warrants it, for sure. All right. Surprisingly, a couple of more questions on Abarth that came in, but you've just answered that, so that's great. Um, and, uh, you know, I think uh, when it comes to uh, the Compass as well, there's a, there's a legion of followers. So Chirag is asking about whether there will be some sort of an update or a facelift on the Compass. 
or would it be a next generation car? Uh, there will be uh, an update, a new compass coming out. Um, I will tell Shirag that you know he should expect um, a vehicle that he will be more than delighted with. But tell me now, uh, Partha, when it comes to what's happened now, I mean, you know, since we still don't have an end date on the current crisis uh, and everything sort of obviously gets pushed forward, uh, what are the kind of scenarios that you're working with? I don't mean so much in terms of production readiness because some of mm -hmm. that would be in place, uh, but in terms of being able to actively look at, especially the new vehicle in production, because those kind of things do take some time. Um, uh, how, how worried are you and then how uh, ready are you? Yeah, so um, so that we have a team, engineering team and a product development team that's you know spread around the globe. You know, we have probably the second biggest team of, you know, um, advanced engineering people sitting here in India. And for those of the viewers who don't know, SCA has between Pune and Chennai about a thousand engineers who work on, you know, the SCA products. Uh, and those people are keeping all the programs running actively because a lot of it is done today as, you know, computation. Yeah. You know, a lot of the, you know, pre-work and the, just before you get to the pilots. Uh, possibility that you know some pilots are delayed yes i think it's always possible that some of the pilot vehicles are delayed especially in a situation like this if it were to continue some more but overall i'm not at all worried about the timing um we will see as you know quarter if there are some you know impact to homologation or any other you know production related activity that has an impact on time. But as of now, I'm not worried about it. Okay, that's fair. Um, you know, I think uh, this is probably, of course, something that everybody would be worried about. It's not just gonna be you or, you know, one particular manufacturer. Um, in terms of where the market goes from here, there's been some talk about how people might now, uh, you know, look to uh, perhaps opt for a greater level of personal mobility over, um, you know, shared mobility, given, you know, the sense of uh, panic or, or worry that might persist. Yeah. Uh, do you firstly agree with that and do you see an, some sort of an opportunity through that as well? Yes, I do agree with it. Uh, so that, in fact, I would say that in the near future, there is going to be that concern. People are not going to want to use public transportation as much. And there's going to be many people who are going to want to switch from public transportation to a more private space. But in fairness, I would say the rest of the answer is too prompt. The first part of it is, the people who are coming from public transportation into a private space may only, you know, get into entry-level vehicles mm -hmm. or two wheels, right? So I would expect to see a surge in two-wheeler, you know, sales in the near future. Um, and surprisingly, in the uh, used car market and or in the second-hand certified pre-owned, such sort of thing. So I would expect it to expect to be the selected for you program that we have in the Jeep portfolio getting a lot more attention than it did in the past and we're already in all of our dealerships. Uh, the second part of it is those who are going to purchase that may be, you know, now saying, okay, let me hold on to the cash for a little longer because this COVID situation is affecting me. So there is a possibility that demand begins to see a little bit of a slump unless you know, the government comes up with some kind of an incentive, such as, you know, a traffic bonus, you know, so on and so forth, which helps push consumption up again. Do you see that happening, though, realistically? The traffic bonus? I something, do some stimulus. Some, the stimulus, yeah, I do see some stimulus happening. Do I know that it'll be a traffic bonus? No. Yeah, sure. I mean, but I think, and stimulus, I think to boost consumption is going to happen. It's going to have to happen. You know, this, I mean, there's a whole uh, network of people who are dependent on this, so. Yeah, logic says that it has to happen, you're right. Uh, and we certainly hope that logic sort of reigns supreme. Uh, yeah. Because this is something that's, you know, it's it's not as if things were great right now. We've anyway come through this huge slowdown and we didn't really see too much. There was a little bit that was done, but perhaps not enough. Uh, so, um, you know, that is something that would become a universal demand. And across industries, it's not just automobiles, right? No, I think it has to be across industry. I think consumption's got to be, you know, you've got to motivate people consuming again. 
because otherwise it's going to have a ripple effect. Okay, you've got a lot of people asking about diesel as well. Uh, you know, more, of course, fans of uh, some of the Fiat diesels and then some of the common rail diesels that you've had, and the Compass certainly has to. Uh, future of diesel as you see it, because especially for your brand, it becomes almost synonymous. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, going into it, now we are, in, you know, we've crossed that threshold. We are BS6 now. So, uh, how do you see that playing out? And do you see an inherent advantage, especially because some other brands have dropped diesel? Um, yes, I do see an inherent advantage. Uh, diesels will continue to stay with uh, a premium products like Jeep, where people are expecting to see performance. Mm. I will be uh, candid and say that in the entry-level segments, especially post BS6, um, I expect to see a change in the mix of more petrol, less diesel in the entry-level segments. Which is, you know, you can see already some of the OEMs and automa uh, you know, automakers reducing their dependence on diesel in the entry level segments. Um, for us, it is obviously an advantage. We know that many of our engines find their way into several of the, you know, vehicles out there in the market. Um, but it is true that as the technology gets uh, stricter and stricter compared to petrol vehicles, diesel vehicles, BS6. Um, you know, become more expensive, clearly because of the added technology. But when you want the performance and when you're in a premium product, especially when you're in the C plus or the D or the E segments, then diesel will continue to be the main thing. But, but part of the point you made about entry level uh, becoming predominantly petrol, I mean, of course, from, an, from a market or, or an OEM, across the board perspective, sure, that makes sense. Uh, but despite the fact that it might mean that extra expense on your side, especially from a development perspective too, uh, wouldn't that be a huge advantage to be able to play in that space because you'd virtually have no other competition? Yeah, I think it would, It would. all other things being equal to that. But if the customer is not uh, going to be able yeah. to pay for the technology, then the demand writes itself. So are you saying for you as well, you would only look at petrol when it comes to just that entry space and then everything else you'd still have diesel? No, we'd have to be, you know, competitively priced. So we would look at diesel and petrol, but I would imagine that if I were making a vehicle uh, today for the, you know, sub four meter area, I would focus more on the petrol than on the diesel. We would offer a diesel for those who want the premium experience, but I would say that the predominant part of the customer base would, you know, probably see the mix skewed towards petrol. All right, a couple more questions and then I'm going to let you go because I know we've gone way over the time that I had promised you. Um, you know, the, the, the point about, uh, I think somebody had asked the question about how the portfolio is going to look like in a few years from now. And so the space below the compass and then the space above the compass. Uh, so I want to get a little clarification from you. The sub four meter space becomes literally the entry part of the market. Um, but then, you know, if you look at the way the Indian market is structured, uh, there is still a, a fair, it's not a chasm anymore, but there's still a fairly big gap even between that and the compass. Uh, so if you're talking about, you know, basically looking at that space as well, is that space that you see as attractive or do you think that that sub four meter product will be enough of a wide portfolio to cater to that entire segment? I think um, instead of splitting that segment, you know, splitting the hairs between, I think four meter vehicle, you know, with its variants would be able to cater to yeah. And, and would the same hold true for above the compass? Because the compass itself has a nice wide stretch. Uh, so between that and then this three-row SUV that you talk about, um, you'd be happy with that mix, catering to that entire stretch. I would. Yeah, I would be happy with that mix, Siddharth. I wouldn't want to split anything between the compass and the three-row. All right, fair enough. Um, there are, of course, I know many more questions that have come in. A lot of talk about how. Uh, you know, uh, even Maruti discontinued the 1.3 uh, engine, which I have to say is one of, one of the most spectacular engines we've ever had. Uh, you know, I think uh, there's that some amount of fiat in, in so many cars. And many people, I think, learn to appreciate diesel as being fun, as being clean, as being modern, thanks to those engines. Um, so it's almost like, you know, we paid tribute to it, in fact, in so many stories. Yeah, no, it, it was, it's was. it been a workhorse and it's been one of our mainstays, you know, um, in so many products in India. So a really fantastic power trade. 
I agree. Uh, okay, one last question I'll take from all the uh, questions we're getting. Uh, that is, uh, I forget now who asked that question. Possibility of Alfa Romeo, is that something that at a group level is being considered even in the future? I don't think we should close the door on it. I think it's something we would consider in the future. Um, that's, you know, a very, very, I mean, personally, I'm a great fan of the brand. And it's um, one of the most stylish brands out there in the world. Iconic, it's fantastic as a brand. So, yeah, we would consider it in the future, for sure. In any case, time most, yeah, no, exactly. The timing right now would be so off given that, you know, the market itself is going to be so destabilized for a while. Uh, we don't really know when we're coming back to what would have been considered normal levels. So I, I suppose all of these decisions get put off till we get back to a sense of being stable again, right? Yes. I think, um, you know, we have to make sure that the resources that are being used in, you know, bringing these products to the market are balanced, right? Especially with the crazy times we find ourselves. So, yes. All right. Well, again, I would have loved to ask you even more, Partha, but let's save some for next time, perhaps. And uh, it's it's great to see you today. Um, and, you know, I, I know that we had planned to do this last week, so I'm glad that we've got our times, uh, you know, together and matched today. Uh, it's really been fun talking with you today. Thank you, Siddharth. And to anybody watching the behind Siddharth, there's a few FCA models missing, so please, FCA guys, send him a few FCA cars to put on his car collection there. <laughs> a few Jeep uh, models, okay? And that has been wonderful talking to you. Shout out to all the people who tuned in. Um, much thanks, and stay safe, stay indoors. I, I, I'm so glad you said this on camera, on like what we would consider live television in the old parlance, but, uh, you know, live online. Uh, yeah, I can't wait to get some uh, some nice Jeep models up there. Just the one little Soul Fiat Bravo that I have <laughs> is up here today, but uh, it will be great to get them. Um, but thank you. I, I think, you know, it, it's been time well spent, uh, always is, and a pleasure meeting you today online. Um, all the best to you as well as your teams for all the days that lie ahead, but most important, please stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Siddharth, and to you. Okay, thank you. Take so, care. You too, uh, Partha. That was uh, Partha Datta, the uh, President and Managing Director at FCA India. And uh, we spoke about a wide range of things there, didn't we? We covered a fair amount, whether it was future product, whether it is planning for those future products, or indeed, of course, what's happening in the current situation, uh, both at FCA and then for the market as a whole. Many of you participated with so many questions. Thank you so much. In fact, I couldn't even get into our contest today because there was just so much happening with uh, the conversation with Partha. So here's what I'll do. I'll remind you about the contest because uh, I do still want many of you to please participate. You have the chance to win a lot of prizes. And so uh, let's quickly take a look at that contest just to refresh your memory on what you need to do. Log on to karinbaik.com slash freewheeling and answer a simple question. Three lucky winners win a two-night, three-day stay at any domestic Club Mahindra Resort. Not just that, at the end of the month, all correct entries are eligible for the grand prize of an all-expense-paid three-night, four-day trip to Dubai or Singapore. So, keep freewheeling. Terms and conditions apply. Okay, so you to keep freewheeling, which means you have to enter that contest. And there you go. That's where you need to go. Currentbike.com slash freewheeling. You'll have all the contest questions up there. There are multiple choice questions only. So we couldn't have made it easier for you. And uh, you've got to just put in your details and enter the contest. And uh, very soon, we'll start to announce winners for last week as well. So, you know, you want to be lucky and you want to win something. Now, I want to quickly of course explain the caveat that uh, none of this would happen in terms of the actual travel uh, until things are safe and things are uh, back to normal but uh, regardless you will still have access to those prizes so if you do win don't worry about it uh, even if you can't avail of that prize right away you can once things are back to normal travel is okay and everything is safe again for you as well as your loved ones keeping that sentiment in mind uh, thank you for joining us today and uh, it is uh, with a very heavy heart that I also talk about a very tragic piece of news that we received this morning about uh, the loss of uh, the president of BMW India, Rudra Tej. He is someone I've known for years and all of us in the automobile industry and related to it are in complete shock because of just the suddenness of this. It comes 
close on the heels of uh, losing another person from BMW just about 10 days ago uh, when we had uh, Mihir from their marketing department also who uh, succumbed to an illness. Uh, with uh, Rudy as well, it's the same. Uh, we are absolutely shocked because we're still trying to get some details and piece that together. But I wanted to mention this because, you know, I would request all of you to just sort of pay your respects. Let's just have a little moment of silence for Rudy. Extremely sorry to have to bring you that news and uh, very, very sorry for uh, having to also send all our condolences to BMW India and indeed, of course, to Rudy's family. Uh, we hope that they find their strength at this terrible, terrible time and uh, may, of course, uh, God rest his soul in peace. Uh, Rudy will be missed. And for those of you who might remember, Rudy also had a spectacular career at Royal Enfield before he came across to BMW and it was just August last year that he took charge as President and CEO at BMW India. A huge loss for the auto industry and a bit of a somber note to end on but uh, want to quickly clarify it had nothing to do with the current COVID situation. This was a different uh, cause that uh, has taken him away from us but having said that please do continue to be vigilant and careful when it comes to the COVID-19 situation. Keep your loved ones safe, keep yourselves safe and out of harm. Please observe the lockdown and uh, please stay safe. If you must step out, please do wear your seat belts. And of course, as always, I'll say it, your helmets too. With that, I'm going to say goodbye. And uh, we have a special one lined up for you tomorrow. Uh, that is, of course, Pratap Bose from Tata Motors tomorrow evening at 8 p.m. So for those of you who would like to ask Pratap any questions on everything new that's happening at Tata Motors, definitely tune in for that. Until then, please take care of yourselves. Stay safe. And bye-bye.